Hello everybody and welcome to today's lesson. Uh, this is kind of an introductory lesson on dairy cattle evaluation and to be more specific we're going to be talking about dairy cows and their anatomy. This is a very basic lesson on the anatomy of dairy cows and some of the basic principles that we use in FFA uh, contests in order to evaluate our dairy cows. So here are some of the things uh, anatomically that we're going to be looking at. You can see I have our slides broke down here into the different areas. We have uh, some emphasis areas and how we should prioritize these different pieces of anatomy. We have the anatomy of the udder. We have dairy character, feet and legs, skeleton, framework, and structure. And then finally, to top it all off, we have body capacity. Now, if we're going to get started, first we need a uh, frame of reference in order to truly determine how important these anatomical pieces or, or parts of the dairy cow truly are. Um, if we don't have a frame of reference, then essentially we're going in blind. We have knowledge, but we, it's going to be harder to apply that knowledge. So, Areas of emphasis are areas of the dairy cow uh, in which evaluators should focus the most on. These areas can be broken down by importance in a percentage format. Below are the listed areas of emphasis and how much they should factor into the placement of dairy cattle. Uh, keep these areas in mind while you're judging dairy cattle and when we're going through the rest of the dairy cattle anatomy guide. You can see here we have the udder listed at 40%. Okay? The udder is almost, is almost half of what you should be evaluating your dairy cows on. That being true because the udder is the most important anatomical part of a dairy cow. Some of you may say, well, that cow, that cow needs to uh, be able to walk. That cow needs to be able to uh, have normal bodily functions in, in a good and healthy digestive tract. And you're, you're right. You're exactly right. But at the end of the day, we can have all of those pieces, and without an udder, we won't produce milk. Uh, for instance, bulls. Bulls don't have an udder. Uh, they don't produce milk. Okay? Um, they may have teats and some, some different factors, but they don't have a working udder. So udder is 40%. Uh, we have dairy character, and you may not know what that is, and that's all right. We'll talk about it. We have uh, that at 20%. Then we have feet and legs at 15%, and that's fairly obvious why, why feet and legs would be important. Obviously, the cow needs to walk and walk properly, but there's some other reasons that we'll talk about in more uh, detail later on. We have framework, which I leave as like a separate section. Um, we like to name it as a separate section from feet and legs, even though in other forms of livestock, such as beef cattle, goats, sheep, and pigs, we talk about it with feet and legs. So in dairy cattle, we're going to talk about them separately, but they both have equal the amount of importance at 15%. And then finally, to top it all off, we have body capacity at 10%. So in order to make it easier for you, uh, I have constructed the PowerPoint in such a way that as we go through it, things are in order. So the first things we talk about are going to be the most important. The last things we talk about are going to be the least important. Okay, we have a couple pictures here. Let's not try and get overwhelmed here. Let's digest it about 5% at a time. So we'll start on the left here. We have a dairy cow. And if you know your breeds, you would know that this is a black and white Holstein. We know that because it is black and white. Um, and the frame size of this animal is typically larger in comparison to the other breeds. Larger, wider, taller, so on and so forth. Uh, let's start with mammary veining. So mammary is just a fancy word for saying the parts of the cow that will end up producing milk. Um, it's the part of that type of the reproductive tract. Um, the mammary system is what we call it usually. The veins are just one particular part of that mammary system, and it, they're very important. Okay. 
uh, it is scientifically proven that the more blood that you end up supplying to the udder, the healthier that udder is going to be and the more nutritious and uh, higher quantity your milk will, will come in. So we want large, prominent mammary veins. This this cow right here is a perfect example of that. She's got one large central vein coming in through here, and she's got some veining throughout the quarters of the udder. So that, that is an example of good mammary veining. Uh, let's look at the teats now. The teats are going to be your primary uh, sources of uh, the outlet for milk. So the teats are where milk is going to come out of. That's where the milker units the machines that milk the cows are attached. So we want we want good teats and these cows should have four teats that are fairly equally spaced. We have two attachments here. Um, whenever I say udder attachment that is just where the udder attaches to the body of the cow. So from here we can see we have two attachments. We have a fore udder and a rear udder attachment. Um, if you're having trouble remembering these, just remember the rear udder attachment is closer to the rear or rump or behind or back end or butt, for a lack of a better term, of the cow. And the fore udder attachment is at the front. Front and fore have the same letter, and in fact, they mean the same exact thing. Okay. Moving on to the rear view of the cow, we have a couple things we can talk about in relation to the udder. We have this cleft or median suspensory ligament that can be shown here. Okay, This crease that comes down the middle that perfectly it should perfectly divide the udder in two is called the cleft. Okay, And the cleft is in reference to this crease. We want a good deep cleft. Um, and this median suspensory ligament runs through that cleft, and you can see it here on the picture on the right. It's kind of raised up here, cutting down the middle. A strong median suspensory ligament will make that that udder uh, better attached, um, and will lead to a higher longevity of the cow. So that's something important that we're going to want to know. Median is just a fancy word for middle. Suspensory is a fancy word for it's what keeps it hanging there, and ligament, a ligament is, well, it's just that, it's a ligament. Um, you can see that median suspensory ligament, or central wall, for uh, a more basic term, is being shown here. And you can see we actually have lateral suspensory ligaments. These are these lateral ligaments are a lot harder to evaluate for quality, so a lot of the times we won't really talk about them. Okay. The median suspensory ligament is important enough that we need to be able to evaluate it and know what it is. You can see here I have some definitions of, of all those things. Um, and if you're wanting to pause the video and read these, go right ahead. I've pretty much already ran through them. These are the uh, proper definitions of each of those. Okay, And that's your most important anatomical parts of the udder. The most important thing uh, that was listed at 40% uh, on the uh, scale of importance. The next highest thing would be dairy character. Now, you may be asking yourself, what is dairy character? Dairy character can be defined as the following. A sharpness at the withers, incurving flat thighs set wide apart, loose and pliable skin, Long, lean, smooth blending necks, a clean cut throat, dewlap and brisket, wide, flat, and well spaced ribs, and deep refined flanks. Okay, those are some terms that you may not know. And that is quite alright. If I'm going to put it as simple uh, as I can, dairy character is all the different factors that can lead to a cow having a higher milk production. Uh, high milk production is a very desirable quality in the dairy industry. A good example of this is that 90% of the cows in the dairy industry are of the Holstein variety, which is a breed. 
So the Holstein breed makes up 90% of all the cows in the dairy industry. And Holstein cows don't produce the highest quality milk of the breeds. Well, you may be asking yourself, or in asking me, Mr. Ellis, why would people use Holsteins if they don't produce the highest quality milk? Holsteins produce the most milk of any breed in terms of quantity. So the dairy industry is one of those few industries where we are willing to take quantity over quality because our breeds are so genetically uh, advanced that we can afford to make that difference. So the difference in quality between the breeds is not as great as the distance that the Holsteins got in terms of quantity. So we want good dairy character because that leads to a cow being able to produce more milk. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much what the rest of these words uh, tell you. So Here is a good example of dairy character. Uh, in my slideshows, if you see uh, a terabang or a purple ribbon, that's what we want. That's what we want to see. That's what we hope to have in these cows. Now, is this cow on the right inherently bad? No. Um, in fact, for a beef, beef animal, she's fairly good. But in the dairy cattle industry, you can see she's going to have a lower producing udder because that's just not what they're focused on. Their genetics have led them to have more muscle and more meat, which is good, especially whenever we're talking about making burgers and steaks. We're talking about producing milk and uh, producing milk that you would use to make cheese and other dairy products like yogurt and things like that. So we want a cow like this one on the left. And you can see from the rear view, we have that sharp V. That's the sharpness at the withers. That's what this area is at the top of the shoulder. It would also be right here on this cow. And you can see we can see her ribs. This cow is not sickly. This cow is not unhealthy. She is a perfect dairy cow in the sense of that's how we want them to be conditioned. Uh, whenever you hear me use the word conditioned, I'm just talking about their fat and meat coverage uh, and the ratio between the two. We don't want them to carry a lot of fat or a lot of muscle because all those nutrients that would normally make up those muscle groups should be going to the milk in the form of protein and then the fat should be going to the milk in terms of creating butter fat. So I always tell the kids uh, in class at this point, how many of you in here, by show of hands, drink 2% milk? And usually I'll have about 75% of the kids raise their hand. Um, then the second question usually gets them a little bit confused. How many of you drink whole milk? A couple of them will raise their hands. A couple of them will leave their hands up because they just drink whatever type of milk gets thrown in front of them. Uh, and we go through all the different percentages. A lot of people don't know that that percentage is actually how much butter fat you have in the milk. So you can see how these different factors of dairy character can begin to become important. Uh, when we talk about the ribs, uh, they're obviously uh, located here where my mouse is currently. These ribs, we want a large body cavity here, and we'll get a little bit more into that when we talk about body capacity. But we want those ribs to be nice and springy and round like a barrel. Okay, so there, there's a little bit about dairy character and some of the anatomical parts you will need to know in order to identify good versus bad dairy character. Moving on to a new topic, we have feet and legs. Okay, You'll often hear farmers and industry professionals say, I want my animals built well from the ground up. They are referring to an animal's feet and legs. Every animal needs to be able to efficiently walk in order to produce the maximum amount of product regardless of their industry. This concept also applies to both dairy cattle and beef cattle. In the dairy industry, cows need to be able to walk so that they can consume adequate amounts of feed and water. For example, Milk is 87% water. 
Cows in general need lots of water, but it is even more important in the dairy industry because we're producing milk. Uh, obviously, the cow has to intake that water before they can then uh, transform it into the milk that they produce. So a dairy cow who is built well from the ground up will not only produce more milk, but will last longer in a dairy operation. We need dairy cows to produce lots of milk and last a long time in, oper in our operation. Uh, so this makes feet and legs essential in the dairy industry. Okay. When I talk about the length the cow is in our operation or longevity, I'm simply saying, well, here, I'll pose it this way. I always ask the kids uh, whenever we're in class, would you rather have a cow produce for five years and make and help you make money for five years or would you rather have that cow produce for seven and they always tell me seven and I always say why and they say well Mr. Ellis if that cow lasts longer um, and I get more money off of her that's a better investment and they're exactly right so they prove that reason to themselves another important factor and this can be largely applied to the swine industry as well. But dairy cows in most operations are on concrete for most of their life. Whenever they're milking, they're usually in some type of open face shed, um, some type of warm or cold housing that uses concrete um, pads in order uh, to keep a cleanly environment. And... Concrete's just the easiest to clean and sanitize. Uh, and so since that they're on concrete their whole lives, they need a good structure and a good feet and legs, uh, leg structure, so that they'll last even longer. Because concrete can be hard on somebody. I don't know if you've ever stood at a livestock show or stood at work all day long, but it starts to take a toll on your body before too much longer, and it wears down on your structure. So we want these animals to be as comfortable as possible. Um, and speaking of their comfort levels, the more, uh, the higher quality life that these animals have will lead to a higher milk production as well. Uh, the main hormone used in milk letdown is oxytocin, um, uh, and it's, oxytocin is becoming an increasingly popular term in our society through tick, funny TikTok memes and things like that, but in the dairy industry it's very serious because we want that cow to milk as easy as possible, and if she's comfortable and in a good environment, uh, th that would be true. We'll get as much milk as we can out of her. So we want these animals to have good feet and legs. Here are some of the terms that you're going to need to know for feet and legs. Uh, there's a lot going on here, so let's just start uh, on the left, and we'll work down and back up in a U. Okay. We'll start at the hips. The hips are really important. Uh, a wide hip leads to a better birthing cow. She's going to have an easier time with reproduction. So we want to know where the hips are. There's actually two parts of the hip. There's the hook bone, which is in the front, and the pin bones, which are down in the rear by the vulva. And they should create this slight V shape here. But um, we want them to be somewhat near level, but have a slightly downward angle. So this cow has a pretty good hip from this view. Excuse me, from this view. Um, yeah, there's your hip. Uh, we have the stifle, which is kind of this area right here. We have the hock, which is a uh, a joint in the leg and rear legs of these livestock animals. The hock, I, I always tell the kids, it's a reverse knee. Uh, think about the direction your knee bends. The hock does the exact opposite. Uh, we have pasterns. We want a nice uh, angle to the pastern here. We don't want it too steep. We don't want it straight up and down. We don't want it... Uh, too flat and rubbing the ground. We want that nice, slight, uh, a little bit above a 45 degree angle. So a little bit closer uh, to vertical than not. Okay, so this these angles on the pasterns of this cow are, are really good. We have hooves. Everybody knows what a hoof is. We have the shank bone. Um, a lot of the times it's called the cannon bone. 
the length of your cannon d directly correlates to the the height of the cow. Um, a longer cannon bone will mean a taller cow. Uh, we have the knee. Everybody knows what a knee is. We have the point of the elbow. We have the point of the shoulder. We have the shoulder blade, and we have the withers. Okay, the shoulder blade or the scapula is this bone that runs uh, at an angle here at the top of the front leg. The point of the shoulder is the little ball that you're going to see on uh, the end of the scapula. And the withers, uh, my uh, arrow for the withers is a little bit off. It should be a slightly further back. But uh, the withers, we want that good angle between the point of the shoulder and the withers. Uh, moving on to skeleton framework and structure, this is going to be the rest of your cow, like the ribs and such. The skeleton framework and structure of the animal refers to the animal's bones. In evaluation, we look at the thickness, angle, and placement of all of these bones. The general structure of the animal is important in the growth of the animal, but also becomes increasingly important during the reproduction process. Feet and legs are accompanied with good structure. Uh, if an animal is not built well in their feet and legs, the problem usually translates to other issues in other structural areas of the animal. In dairy cattle, we have to ensure that females are bred and produce offspring in order for them to start the milking process. Having good quality structure um, and frame framework can make the reproductive process easier uh, on the animal and the farmer alike. And here's a bunch of terms. We're not going to go through all these. If you want to pause the video, uh, feel free to do that now. But here are a bunch of different things. Um, and I usually quiz the kids on most of these. Uh, and they always get the ones like the forehead and the nostrils and things like that. But here you go. Here's your picture. And then finally, our last slide, we have body capacity. So body capacity is a volumetric measurement of the capacity of the cow. Body capacity in dairy cattle evaluation is more of an eyeball test uh, than something we would measure. We desire dairy cows who have a deep body and a wide frame. Greater body capacity allows for an easier time of calving and an easier keeping cow. Uh, when we say a cow is easier keeping uh, than her than her peers we're basically saying she you know doesn't always eat as much feed she doesn't have problems structurally um, and she's just easy going she's low maintenance would be a good way to put it so you can see we have a cow here that's deep in the fore and rear ribs we have a cow here on the left that is shallow in the fore and rear ribs uh, and you can see the air below the animal takes up just as much or more space than the actual body of the animal and that's the eye test we're really looking for for body capacity you can see on this cow the area the body takes up is greater than the air than the air below the cow that's a really really good way to eye test body capacity now of course we need to get in behind that cow and really analyze how wide she is to the ground so we would do that by looking at the distance in between their front and rear legs um, and then we would also look at the width of her ribs. Whenever I look at the ribs on this side that we can see and the ribs on the back side of the cow, they should be wide apar apart. That'll give more room for the cow's organs and make her uh, inadvertently eat more, which will be good for milk production. And that is the end of the anatomy guide. You got a little bit of evaluation in there too, but that always helps the kids determine uh, and kind of gives them a good introduction to this topic of evaluation by going through the anatomy PowerPoint. So um, thank you all for listening today. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, comment on the video and inter interact with it as you see fit. And I hope this really helps in your classrooms and uh, have have a wonderful rest of your day and rest of your week.